Um, who here reads the uh, ASPO USA's Peak Oil News? It's a daily pub. Raise your hands. Wow, cool. Next year at this time when I do that, I hope everyone will. It's a free publication. The, the, the editor of that publication, uh, Tom Whipple, is a former, oh, by the way, who reads the Peak Oil Review? Okay, it's a, also, it's, it's more for time short folks. Uh, it's designed for like, say, his wife, who is a state senator in Virginia and hadn't got time to read that daily Peak Oil News. Um, Tom puts in probably two hours every morning into that Peak Oil News, every day of the week, every day of the year. Um, He's a former CIA analyst. He used to babysit overnight the CIA's morning briefing for the president. So he knows how to scan the news for what's important and make sure that it's brought to the president's attention. He did that for over a decade. Um, uh, he's developed a super efficient means of scanning the news for the peak oil nuggets, uh, anywhere from covering the story recently in Paraguay to what's going on there. And, and uh, uh, Zambia and so on with uh, problems with supply that are, you know, went to the question last night about poor, and this morning about poor countries and how they're having to deal with shortages uh, to what's going on in Alaska and you name it. Um, because Tom has put in such an extraordinary period of time on this uh, effort, these two efforts uh, for a year and a half now, we've decided that we had to create an, an award uh, and that's called the Volunteer of the Year Award. Um, not only does, is Tom the first recipient of that award, but the award hereafter will be named after him. It'll be called the Whipple Volunteer Award. And there, there's... <laughs> and, and, and there's also a, there's a second reason why we're calling it the Whipple Award. He has no competition. There'd be no way we could have an, another awardee because he puts in so much time on this. If you're not a reader of the Peak Oil News or the Peak Oil Review, uh, we strongly encourage you to sign up for it. It's available on the ASPO USA website. And I want to present that award to our next speaker, Tom Whipple. Well, as, I, as I'm about the only thing keeping you from the reception here, I will attempt to be mercifully uh, brief on this thing. They've asked me to talk a few minutes about the relationship of peak oil and the mainstream media in the United States. Since I spend a good many hours a day you know, going through this, I think I've got a fairly good feel for where we are. And I want to do this in the form of some rhetorical questions here. First question is simply, why are we here today? Well, after seven or eight hours, you get a pretty good idea is to hear about peak oil. But in a broader sense, we are here and ASPO exists simply because the mainstream media so far are saying very close to zero about the whole phenomenon of peak oil, which I think most of us here believe is a very serious topic. Okay, so now we can ask ourselves, why is the media paying so little attention to peak oil? Well, the reasons are various. I have talked to some people in the press. Some have said, never heard of it. Others have said, absolute nonsense, there is plenty of oil, goodbye. Some people suggest that maybe it's the sort of thing that our readers don't want to hear about. This is, as we know by now, a fairly gloomy, depressive topic. <laughs> and uh, this, doesn't necessarily sell newspapers. I think the major reason, though, is, as I point in the bottom over here, so far in the story of peak oil, there has been no smoking gun. It has crept out, up to us bit by bit, dollar by dollar, as, the, each, as our barrels of oil creep up. And there really has not yet been a defining moment which gets everybody's attention. I think this is what, one of our problems today. Last year, we've had, or we've heard earlier today, there have been two major reports. GAO and National Petroleum Council put them out. As far as I could tell, in the mainstream media, these got very, very close to zero attention. A couple of stories on the you know, Dow Jones Newswire ran about, and that was about it. Why not? Simply because, in the, as we heard earlier today, 
in the conclusions of these papers, there was no particular zinger. Nothing says, my God, the end of civilization is hours away. If it did say it, it was buried back at page 134 in very fine print. Uh, and that is basically one reason why we've seen very little of this stuff in the mainstream media. Next question, do we really care if the mainstream media picks us up or not? And I personally think the answer has to be an emphatic yes. We do care. We all care very much. Every you know, person living in the civilized world cares. They may not know it yet, but they do. The reason for this is quite simple. You know, until governments, parliaments, Congress, legislatures, and anybody who's involved in making kind of policy, major industrial corporations, et cetera, et cetera, get a gra grasp on this thing, very little is going to happen from the policy point of view. As far as I can see, only the mainstream media can bring this about. I am well aware, as I live with it all day long, there is plenty of coverage on peak oil out there on the internet. But this is getting to a tiny, tiny fraction of the people in America. And until, you know, cable news, CBS, major newspapers start talking about this, I think we've got a problem. Okay, next point. Are we detecting any change in all this? And I think the answer is yes. We heard a little about this last night. Somebody, I thought it was a very clever idea, they Googled peak oil in the Los Angeles Times and got zero, and they Googled peak oil in the Irish Times and got 17 hits. A little bit of progress. Uh, I watched the press of the world fairly carefully, and we are seeing, as we heard a little bit last night, some scattered stories, you know, probably a handful, two handfuls or something across the U.S. that really are starting to you know, tell the outlines of the peak oil story. But these do not constitute a critical mass that will move your government. All you have to do is look at what happened to energy policy in Congress this year, and it is going, from a peak oil perspective, energy bills up there are absolutely close to worthless. They're all over the map. The last thing I read is the president's threatened to veto the whole nine yards. And it doesn't, you know, it lowers taxes or raises taxes or something in the oil industry. So the whole thing's going away. You can't, you can't get the Senate together with the House, you can't get inside the House. Basically, the message of peak oil has not yet settled into the U.S. Congress, despite the best efforts of you know, the peak oil caucus up there with constant speeches and flyers and whatnot. It just has not gotten there. Let me give you a very quick current example here. Yesterday, the New York Times Morning Edition carried a major story on, believe it or not, oil setting a new high of $88 a barrel. Now this to me looked like an excellent opportunity to start grappling with why has oil gotten $88 a barrel? Very good question. I think around here most of it can give you some you know, fairly coherent ideas. But anyway, the, start, the story lays out, lays out the facts. We got to $88 a barrel yesterday and oh my goodness, this is almost $90, which is very close to the inflation adjusted at all time high. And way down the bottom of the story, they start to talk about why. Well, they talk about everything under the sun. The Turks are about to blow up the Kurds. Or refineries are breaking down in the U.S. The dollar is weak. People are buying oil so they don't have to have dollars. Gee, the Middle East is a mess. There's a war in Iraq. There's violence in Nigeria. The, v the Venezuelans are taking our oil. The Chinese are buying or building, on and on it goes. And somewhere down at the bottom, we get the first little hint of what may be the problem, i.e., oh, and by the way, the International Energy Agency is sort of predicting that we might be using 88 million barrels per day next year. Now, needless to say, the story does not go on, and by the way, we're only going to be producing 85 or 86, but that's okay. <laughs> and what I'm saying, for a major story on about a major oil development, which this clearly was yesterday, there should be another one today, because I guess it got to 89 today, so we have to write the $89 story tomorrow morning. See so, you know, this sort of thing. But again, I think the major point was, not only is there no mention in this story of peak oil, uh, we're only getting the barest hints of it. They are starting to hint. They don't say the words because they're probably getting pretty close to dirty words, but they use a little quote there which you can 
read your leisure, but they say that oil prices are quadrupled and there's a strong demand. This is all, everything we heard here today. And there's little spare production capacity. The oil markets are volatile. That's why we have $88 oil. They do not as yet in the American media take the final step and say, by the way, things are going to get worse and we call this worse peak oil. Some people call this worse peak oil. That's what it is. So what I'm suggesting to you today is we are getting very, very close. We're probably about 80% of the way there based on this paragraph. They certainly aren't head gliding. This, this thing was you know, at the bottom of the story when they attempt to explain what's going on here. But uh, there is hope. What will force a change in the media coverage? When, when's the day we're going to see you know, a word's headline, you know, a word's peak oil in a headline? Uh, personal opinion is it's not going to be price increases in the foreseeable future are not going to do it. We can see a $90 oil, a $100 oil will be a day story, a $120 oil will be a two-day story. As I think we've talked about here, you know, you can probably double the price of gasoline, and it's probably not going to, you know, really provoke a crisis. You know, we took a lot of polls a year or so ago when oil started taking off, and the basic of the Americans said, you are only going to pull my hands off that steering wheel when I'm stone dead. Because I'm going to spend every last piece of resource I have to keep that tank full. I will sell the furniture, I'll max my credit cards, I will sell the children, I will sell the house, I'm going to keep driving that car. That's probably not too far from the truth. It's not exaggerate too much. Of I think I'm going to suggest to you that as far as America is concerned, we are only going to see a major shift when something, you know, let's face it, it's going to take shortages. It's going to take major, major inconveniences to people's lifestyles before we see a major shift. Uh, and as far as I'm concerned, having lived through the, you know, the 1973 and 80 problem before with the lines, the odd and even days, and this sort of thing, it's going to take that, and it's going to take that prolonged for a period of time. At that point, as we said before, there will probably be, you know, major crisis ensue. Rush on the gas pumps, you know, drain out the, drain out the reserves, et cetera, et cetera, people filling tanks, running around with red cans, and this sort of thing. At this point, you know, Political politicians of this country will have to react. There will have to be new policies set. There will have to be rethinking. People will start asking questions, what's behind all this? And somewhere, the media will discover peak oil. Until that time, uh, I suspect we'll see about where we are now. They will describe each new you know, price increase with you know, the same, bunch, you know, same list of reasons. Again, they could probably rewrite the stories right now. You know, pull the raisins and run them out again. They look pretty good. And with that, I thank you very much for listening.